Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. Thank you for joining us today. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you're in the neighborhood, come on by at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And today we are in the book of 2 Timothy. And we are in chapter 2. Chapter 2. <clears throat> Now, a reminder as we're going through this <clears throat> that we need to be open to the Holy Spirit as he leads us in this study and hear what the Lord is saying to us. You see, I can't teach anybody anything. That has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. I am just kind of like the voice, or let, let's put it this way. I'm like the scalpel in the hands of a doctor. You know, it's the doctor that performs the surgery um, it is the scalpel that he is using to perform that surgery. So I am in the sense, as I study and study the, the Bible, and I've been doing for 30 years, uh, the original language, um, I then am used by God to just share the simple gospel message, and then it's up to the individual to really receive it from the Lord. Uh, and the way that you do that, basically, is first by uh, acknowledging Jesus Christ as the only way to heaven, and that he came to this earth to die for the sins of men and that he resurrected from the dead. And if you believe that, the Bible says you will have eternal life. And then allow the Holy Spirit to enter into you and begin to teach you these things. So let's go ahead and pray and we will get into chapter 2 of Second Timothy. Gracious Father, we do want to be teachable, Lord. We want to know the truth, Father. We want to be open to your word that is so clear and so accurate, Lord. We want also to remove any thoughts that we may have, any ideas that we may think to be true or right, and replace them with your truth, Lord. <clears throat> you have given us enough truth from Genesis to Revelation, Lord, to live a godly life and a life that would reflect our relationship with you, Lord. And so we pray for humility and for love and grace and mercy, and yet, Father, for, <clears throat> for truth. As Jesus said, that, that we are to um, understand that there's a truth and there's also a spirit of that truth. We're not to walk necessarily by sight, but we're also to walk by faith. And so not just looking at the situations, not just looking at the world and what's going on, but also in light of that truth, in light of the word of God, how do we look at the world? How do we look at what's going on in our lives? And we need that badly, Father, in our life. And so, Lord, minister to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Okay, so Paul's teaching uh, Timothy how to be a good pastor within the church. And so this letter, along with 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, Titus, are what they call pastorical epistles. An epistle is just a letter. These are letters that Paul wrote to these men who were pastoring a church in their area. Now, again, for me, and, and I harp on this stuff because you, just, you hear it all the time and people just don't get it. But to me, they're writing to a pastor of a church, right? So that means that they are meeting somewhere as a community, right, in a building. And so it's important that we go to church. That's my point. Uh, along with uh, Timothy, the pastor, the elders, the deacons that Paul shared with him how to set up and, and then fellowshipping. And now the good servants that are serving within the church there. So let's go ahead and read chapter two. It says, you therefore, my son, he's speaking to Timothy, that is Paul, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, what does he mean by that? Be strong in the grace. He didn't say be strong in the law of the Bible. He didn't say be strong in the liberties of life, be strong in the world. He's saying be strong in the grace that is in Jesus Christ. What is the grace that is in Jesus Christ? Well, Christ came to have favor or grace upon us. He gave us grace instead of law. Grace means in the Greek, um, favor. And it is continual favor. Ephesians 2.8 says very clearly, for by grace you have been saved, and it's through faith, right? And so be strong in the grace that God has given to us. That is the liberties of the gospel message. 
He has washed away our sins, so we need to understand that, that we live by grace now, not by the law, but God has forgiven us past, present, and future sins. We are Christians, we are believers in Christ Jesus, and we need to live by that forgiveness every day. Do we fail? Yes. Does that mean we need to be put up on a shelf? Depends, and we'll see that in a moment. If we continue to sin, then there's a possibility that God has, has put you up already on a shelf. But we're to live by grace. And so be strong in that grace. Don't live by the law. Don't measure yourself by others. Don't measure yourself by the law and think that you have to perform or do some act that's going to please God. God is already pleased with you. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Does that have anything to do with you? No, not at all. Not at all. You have nothing to do with it at all. You are just believing in what Jesus did upon that cross and in his resurrection. So be strong in that. And there is some strength in that. And there's some peace and rest in that in your relationship. And that, and the things that you have heard from me, that is the Apostle Paul, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So again, instructing Timothy here to teach others. And so what Paul has learned, he gives to Timothy. What Timothy learns, he gives it to his men and then his men. And it just has gone out throughout the centuries, people teaching one another. What I have learned from my pastor, he learned from his pastor, Pastor uh, Chuck Smith, and they each passed it down. And then Chuck Smith became my pastor and I started learning from Pastor Chuck Smith and I learned from other pastors constantly. And I take those truths and I pass them down to uh, other men. Now that is called discipleship, right? Where you are teaching people uh, what you have learned. Um, let me just say this for those of you that are on the discipleship side, the disciple side. Oh, thank you, Lord Jesus. <laughs> Patty's here. What a blessing. <clears throat> So taking it from a discipleship side, guys, we really need to, hear, hear what I'm saying here. We really need to be teachable. We really need to be teachable. Um, when I was in high school, there were certain people that got A's. That wasn't me. <laughs> I didn't get A's. I got D's or D minuses or F's <clears throat> because I wasn't teachable. First, I didn't listen to the teacher. I didn't care what the teacher had to say. So I didn't do what the teacher said. When homework assignments came about, I didn't do them. I just didn't do them, didn't turn anything in because there was nothing to turn in. And so I was totally unteachable at that moment. There are, like, there are people like that in the church. They call themselves Christians, they receive Jesus Christ, and they probably are, but they'll sit there and everything that you say, they don't agree with, they'll critique it, and they won't receive it. So they're not teachable. <clears throat> they're not teachable. Well, aren't we supposed to do that? Of course we are. We are to critique it in light of the word. So if they're teaching the word of God and that's what the word is saying, then no, you should receive it as the Lord is speaking to you. So, um, but there were those students in high school, I remember that just got straight A's. Why did they get straight A's? Because they listened to the teacher. They did what the teacher said. They, they took all the tests. They got 100% on it. They did their studies. They did it exactly as, you know, because there were, there were homework assignments, right, where I want you to do an essay, and your essay has to be in an outline form with all the references at the bottom. And they did exactly what they said. They were teachable. They got an A. So as Christians, we need to be teachable. <clears throat> what is being said? Is it biblical, and is it in the Bible? And if it is, then I want to receive it, and now I need to accept it, whether I truly understand it all or not, it needs to become mine. I remember when I first went to church, first Christian church I've ever been to being Catholic all my life. And I remember the pastor got up there to teach and I was like this, remember Jim? It was on an Easter Sunday, he wore an all white suit, had white shoes, and I was scared out of my, you know, out of my socks. Cause I thought to myself, Jim Jones, his name is Jim, and then there's a Jones thing. And I thought, what did I get myself into? You know, and I was cautious. I had my whole family there. And he started teaching the Bible, the Easter story. And I'm listening to every word he says. And I'm like, okay, that's what it says. Okay, I agree. Okay, and I'm just like listening. But at any point, I, I didn't say uh, here where, you know, like we just read, witness, uh, commit these to faithful men. He said, now we need to commit these to faithful men. I didn't say, oh, no, we don't. You know, I didn't fight that because that's what it says. That's what it says. So 
I'm in a sense discipling you right now and sharing with you my experiences and how we need to be teachable as Christians. That's how a church will grow. It won't grow with unteachable people. It just won't because they're just gonna constantly be fighting. So they are what Pastor Chuck Smith called blessed subtractions. It's better for them to leave and not come here because they're just gonna cause division within the church. And that's okay, they can move on and maybe find another church that's perfect for them somewhere. So teach them. You therefore must endure hardship, Timothy, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul says a good soldier, uh, courageous, noble, is what the word good means. Um, it's a battle, right? Our Christianity and what we believe in is a battle against a lot of opposition. One, the enemy, and then how the enemy uses the world uh, to fight against us and truth. And I don't know if you've ever been in any battles with people, you know, trying to share the truth, and then they don't receive the truth, and so you're going back and forth in this battle. It is a battle. And that means there's going to be casualties. That means people will get upset. That means people won't like you. That means that you will suffer hardship or affliction even. And at Timothy's time, they were being crucified. They were being um, judged and as criminals because of their faith. And we're headed in that direction too. We already see that. <clears throat> Christians are haters because they don't you know, believe in and what's going on in the world today, they shouldn't be involved in politics. And so, you know, we shouldn't go to that church. You know, they should just teach love, 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 love. You know, but Jesus is also just, and he's a judge too. And judgment's coming, and we forget about those things. <clears throat> so, he says here, you're going to suffer hardship as a good soldier in Christ. No one engage in warfare, entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. So Paul is telling Timothy, if you enlist in the kingdom of God and become a Christian, then you become a soldier of Christ. You are fighting for Christ's kingdom, not for the worldly kingdom, right? You don't entangle yourself with this world. You separate yourself from this world. So we as Christians here are to fight on the same team. I really believe that if you find that you're not on the same team as, as Christianity, then you're on the wrong team. You know, if you're fighting against Christians, you're on the wrong team because you should be agreeing uh, with Christians. <clears throat> and so Paul goes on, and also if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. So he's giving this picture. There are rules to follow. The Bible is our rule book and we need to follow it. Hard, uh, and he goes on, the hardworking farmer must first, or, or must be first, uh, to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all these things. Now, what is he saying there to Timothy? Well, Timothy, you're the pastor of the church, and like a farmer who farms a field, he gets to partake of the crops. So they should be taking care of you as a church, is what he's saying there. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David, that is King David in the Old Testament, he comes from his lineage, was raised from the dead according to the gospel, for which I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even to the point of chains, but the word of God is not chained. So Paul is saying, look, remember the gospel, Jesus resurrected from the dead, this is what we are to preach, but people will not receive it, they'll chain you, but the gospel is not chained, the gospel will go out because we will continue to preach that gospel to a dying world. Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. This is a faithful saying, for if we die with him, we shall also live with him. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. We cannot deny him. There's a couple of things that we need to be warned of here. If you deny him, he's going to deny you. How do, how do we deny him? Well, you might purposely deny him, say, no, I don't know Christ, and I don't believe that he's God. I don't believe he came to this earth. I don't even believe he's a, a historical figure. Then you're denying him. Then you'll stand before God as a judge. Other ways that we can deny him is by our lives, the way that we live. 
Uh, we say we're Christians and we might even go to church, but yet we go back to our jobs and we do the things that we do and we're still involved in the world doing worldly things. Um, this is very um, dangerous and deceptive, guys. Very dangerous and deceptive. Because Jesus said very clear in John chapter 8 that um, those that are his will have fruit, evidence of their salvation. And if you don't have that fruit, then you're not his. You're Ill 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 illegitimate children of his. And that's deceptive because that's a judgment point on others that see you. Because others see who you are that are believers and they know what a believer is. They know. They've been studying it for years. And they know their spirit will bear witness with someone. But then when you bring it up to them that why are you always doing this in the world and doing that in the world but you're not doing anything at church? Oh, well, I have a right. I don't understand things. I'm not there yet. You know, whatever excuses, no, it's not going to cut it. If you're not an orange tree and you're an apple tree, then you're not an orange tree. There's no fruit bearing that truth. So that's a scary place to be. You can deny him by your life. Uh, you can deny him by fighting against his people, right? You can deny him by fighting against his people. When you come against him, Paul mentions it all over the place. This person left me. This person attacks me. This person was with us, but no, they're no longer with us. They're now back into the world. These are people that are against the church, and they denied him. And Jesus made it very clear that if you hurt the least of these little children, you've done it unto me. So when we are against the church, against the truth, we're against Christ. And he says, I will judge you for that. Verse 14. Remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit, to the ruin of the hearer. Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That is so important, rightly dividing the word of truth. What does that mean, rightly dividing the word of truth? That means that you're reading the Bible and you're observing it and you're interpreting it correctly and then you're applying it correctly. That's what it means, rightly dividing the word. Um, someone made a, a, a statement that the Bible is written in simple Greek. At that time, a child could have picked up the Bible and understood what it said. When God wrote this book through men and their language, he wanted to make sure that everybody understood it very clearly. So it was easy enough that everybody could understand it, except for who? Unbelievers. Unbelievers. People that are blinded to the truth. Again, read, I encourage you to, if you go home today, read John chapter eight. And he talks about the religious men, that is the Pharisees and so forth. And they would not believe Jesus. They would not believe what he spoke. Uh, just like men don't believe what the Bible says. I don't understand that. I don't know what it means. And so I'm not going to receive it. No, I'll fight against it. It's because they're blinded to it. And if they're blinded, what does that mean? They have no understanding. And if they have no understanding, what does that mean? They're not filled with what? The Holy oh, Spirit. Because he's the one that teaches us, right? Mm -hmm. So they need to really get on their knees, repent, and say, God, I want to receive your word by faith. I want you to fill me with the Holy Spirit that I may receive your word and believe it so that it changes my life. And that's what's rightly dividing the word of God means from Genesis to Revelation uh, all the way through. This is what gets us in trouble as a church and we're divided. Uh, people say, well, there's so many fractions within the Christian church. Well, not really, not really. When it comes to the fundamentals, we're all in unity. I don't, you know, whether you're uh, Lutheran, Methodist, or Calvary Chapel, Baptist, um, you know, uh, non-denominational, there's a fundamental line, and that is that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He came, born of a Virgin Mary. He died on the cross for our sins. He resurrected from the dead. That's an underlying foundational truth, and so we have that truth. Now, all the other particulars may vary here and there depending on the leadership of the church and what God has called them to do. Um, even within Calvary chapels, there are variances, but not errors and not f divisions in the sense uh, of uh, misrepresenting the word. No, these variances are based upon the differences of the individuals. And I'll give you an in instance of this very clearly in the Bible. Peter was a Jew. God called Peter to who? To minister to who? To Jews, right? 
Heman, Heman brought a cloth down an axe, remember, and said, look, here, look, eat, eat of this. And G Peter said, no, Lord, not so. I don't want to eat of that. I've been taught in the law that, that you're not to eat of this food. And Jesus said, no, now I've made it clean, so you eat of it. What I say is clean is clean now. So Peter ate of it. He's supposed to take that vision and let the Jews know that God has called the Gentiles too. Peter's called to the Gentiles. So Peter's language is going to be what? Very, Gen very Jewish, right? I'm sorry, he's called to the Jews. It's going to be very Jewish. He's going to talk about the Old Testament law. He's going to talk about Moses and Abraham. He's going to talk about the saints in the Old Testament. Very Jewish language. Now we look at the Apostle Paul. Who is Paul called to? Gentiles. Gentiles. Paul's Jewish, but he's called to the Gentiles. His language is going to be totally different than Peter's. He's got a different calling. Guys, churches are called to do different things. So this church is called to do something different than the church down the street. We're not to be duplicates, copies, over and over of each church. The truth is, but the way that that's run within the differences are, are different. This community is different compared to the community in Chino Hills. Now, Jack Hibbs is very political. He gets into a, a lot of the um, politics of Eastern uh, situations like China and, and the Muslims, Al Qaeda, and those kind of That's what he's called to do, that kind of thing. And he does that quite often, a lot. In fact, he just did a whole series on the school education. Now, here's a church, Sunday mornings, and they're talking about the school system and how it's misrepresenting what it was established to do and so forth. I just went to a conference uh, here in Riverside for Christian pastors to let us know what Riverside County is doing uh, with our children and what they're planning on doing. A school board was there. And it's interesting because they're bringing in the secular information and they're going to teach these kids this information. Our kids, your kids, because they're in school. Mm -hmm. And they're going to teach them. And this is what it was about. They're going to teach them to be homosexuals. They're not wow. teaching them biology. They're going to teach them how to be homosexuals, that it's okay to be homosexual, that you have a right to be homosexual. In fact, they're, they're even teaching them that if your parents tell you anything bad about it, it's like breaking your civil rights, and you have rights against your parents. This is what's coming down. Now, people don't know this because they don't go to the meetings, and they don't care to look into that stuff. So Jack had a whole weekend conference on that. That's what God's called him mm. to do. God's called me to do specific things here, which includes feeding the homeless, being actively involved in my community, but also when voting comes around that I'm in involved also politically. And what's unique about our church is we get into the Greek, right? We teach the Greek, the original language on Sunday mornings. You don't have that in a lot of, I don't know of any church that has it the way we do, where I actually verse by verse cut it up to you in the Greek language and you get the tense of what is being said there. So that's unique in our church. And so we're to just come along and say, let's support that because God's called us here to minister. And so that's what Paul is telling Timothy here. Uh, you be faithful with what I've, got, I've done with you or I've given to you. He goes on, remind those, or remind them of these things, ch charging them, verse 14, before the Lord, not to strive about words to no profit. Verse 15, be diligent to present yourself a proof of God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. Vain babblings are, are, are uh, um, um, selfish um, words you know things that you're that people just want to argue because they have a belief and they think it's right and they don't care what the bible says so they will just say their babblings their words and it's vain because it's very selfish that's what they think and, and see that's the problem with so many is they don't understand we need to replace our thinking with god's thinking right that's the whole purpose of being a christian replacing our minds with him um Romans chapter 12, right? We are to be a living sacrifice, which is a reasonable service. Uh, we are not to conform to this world, but conform our minds to the word of God, renewing them in the word of God. That's what the Bible teaches. We're to get rid of that old thoughts, that vain babblings, that selfish babblings that we believe. So he says, shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase to more ungodliness, and their message will spread like cancer. Then he mentions a couple of names. Uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus are of this sort, who have strayed concerning the truth, 
saying that the resurrection is already past and they overthrew the faith of some. They overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the, the solid foundation of God stands, having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity or sin. So here's these two guys and what they were doing is they believed that the, res that the, um, that the resurrection already came to pass, that Jesus already came and raptured the church up and they're already in heaven. Now you would think that that's, so what, who cares? Well, it's a big deal because that means everybody else is going through the tribulation period and that Christ is going to come back the second time. And that's false doctrine because God has not um, come back yet. Uh, there are some that believe that today. Hank Hanegraaff is one of those guys. They believe he's a, what they, it's called preterist view, the preterist view. They believe back in AD 70 that Christ returned and he took his people out and that the, we are now in the tribulation age. Again, it's false teaching. It's not true. And Paul makes that clear here that even then, there were some that were teaching this. And so, again, if we're believers, we're to depart from sin. Verse 20. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood, clay, some of honor and some of dishonor. So th that's the truth, right? We all know this. There are people within the church. Some of them are doing great works. Some of them are doing mediocre works. Some of them are doing... Uh, little work. <laughs> you know, that's just the way it is. Um, it's all up to the individual. Thessalonians made it clear when we were going through it. Uh, Paul encouraged them, you know, now that you're doing, do more. And it's always about doing more, getting involved more, being more busy. I'm busy right now. You know, I've got a place that I got to go for two weeks that I'm preparing for. I've got a men's retreat that I'm preparing for. You know, I've got another leadership meeting that I'm preparing for. And then Justin invited me to go to his Greek class on Tuesday nights and I accepted. Then he invited me to go on his Thursday night uh, to his history class and I accepted. So now I've got every Tuesday and Thursday till the end of the year. I am like crazy busy, you know, but I'm busy doing the word of God, my choice. And so I'm so busy I can't breathe, but that's okay. You know, I'm doing the work of God. And there are some that just, well, they set up. And, I, and, and by the way, guys, I'm not condemning anybody in this situation. It's just the way it is. Some that set up their ministries on Sunday or on Wednesdays, and then, then that's it. They just do that. And then others that, that just come to church and sit, and they just do that. And others that just bring their kids, you know, and take off, and they just do that. And so there are always those vessels of honor, and, and it just goes down the line. But the reality is this, guys. We all have a choice. We can get as busy as we want Amen. and serve in the kingdom of God. It's all up to us, or we cannot get as busy, and that's up to you too. Therefore, verse 21, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel of honor, sanctified, useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Flee also useful lust, but pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace, which those who call on the, on the Lord out of a pure heart, but avoid foolish and Ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Wow. That's a commandment. Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. There are people that are ignorant to the word of God, and they just want to argue. They just want to argue. I'll go to a certain point, and then I just stop. I said, that's it, because obviously you're not teachable, and you're not hearing what the word of God says, so I leave you in God's hands. I pray for you. I love you. I care about you, but you're not willing to be teachable. And it's going to only lead to strife. We see that. Uh, anytime someone starts to argue over things, you want to argue back. And then now you've got an argument and you get a strife and you get a division. So, and Paul says that's not good for the church. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach and patient. Now, did he say uh, he must not quarrel and not Share the truth? No, he didn't say that. He just says, share the truth. Just don't quarrel. Be gentle, but teach and, and able to teach patiently that truth in humility, correcting those who are in opposition. And that's the whole thing, correcting those who are in opposition. I had a little neat little conversation with some people because I kind of took the um, liberal side in this conversation because you hear the liberals all the time now you know when 
when a white person uh, says something uh, against a black person, you know, that uh, they'll say, oh, you're just white privileged. And so um, that's their excuse now to just say, you don't know what you're talking about. You're white privileged. You have no understanding of this. And, and that's not an excuse at all. <clears throat> that's not an excuse. They're just trying to hate them. And so I decided as, as a conservative Christian, when a, a friend of mine had, had commented on a post that I had, I decided I was gonna I was gonna play that. I go, well, it's because you're white privilege. You don't understand what's going on, you know. And then I told them what I was doing. I go, it's obvious it doesn't work the other way because they get upset over it, you know. So it just doesn't work. And that was my point. That was my point. That's why it's not an argument. So gently share your views. This is what I believe, and then you leave it at that. A servant of the Lord must not be quarrelsome. So verse twenty five in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God purposes, or if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth. That's one reason why I do take time sometimes. I don't do it all the time, but I'm trying to correct those in opposition to the faith, trying to give them answers, trying to help them think. Sometimes they get upset and they don't want to think. That happens. Other times, some people do get it, and they end up repenting and turning to Jesus Christ and giving their life to him. We were all there, by the way. I was the same way. When someone used to come up to me and tell me how I ought to live, I'd say, who do you think you are? You know? And then all of a sudden, my eyes were open. I repented. I'm like, wow. All those people really loved me that took the time to share with me, even though I hated them at the time. But now I appreciate that they were willing to plant seeds in my heart. And that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him, to do this, his will. That's, that's a crazy place to be, guys. If you're arguing against God's people, you're in, a, you're in a bad place. That's the snare of the devil. And unfortunately, it may not be critical for you at this moment, but if something were to happen to you, you'll stand before God and he may, he may just say to you, depart from me because I don't know you. I don't know you at all. And that's not where you want to go. You don't want to send your kids there either. Um, you see, the searching for truth is not a searching for your truth. A searching for truth is a searching for God's truth. If you believe in a God, then he has truth. And I believe the Bible is his truth. Yes. And everything that is written in it is true. And everything that's there should be received and accepted, whether we understand it or not. If we could understand God, we'd be God. <laughs> So there are things that we have to just accept by faith Amen. that are true because he said it. Amen? And you all agree here? Yes. You all do, right? Amen. Gracious Father, thank you, Lord. May you bless your people today. Lead them, guide them, Father. And they've been challenged today with the word of God. Yeah, we have to stand up to opposition. Whatever that opposition is against Christianity, our children, and even the children of others, Lord, we can't stand by and let what's going on happen to our precious children, Father, or those around us, Father. We need to teach the truth of what Jesus has commanded us to do, Lord. May you bless those that are listening, Father. May you open up their eyes, give them understanding. May they repent and turn to Jesus Christ and allow him to be their Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. God bless you guys. Thank you for joining us. If you have any prayer requests, we'd love to pray for you, so post it on Facebook or private message me and we'll pray for you. We're gonna take some time and pray right now. God bless, have a wonderful weekend. If you don't have a church to go to, come and join us. We're at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. Love to have you here.